translation o supreme lord undoubtedly we are inhabitants of the most pious planets the jana tapas and satyalokas but still we have been purified by the drops of water sprinkled from your shoulder hairs by the shaking of your body purport ordinarily the body of a hog is considered impure but one should not consider the hog incarnation assumed by the lord is also impure that form of the lord is the personified vedas and is thus transcendental the inhabitants of the jana tapas and satyalokas are the most pious persons in the material world but because those planets are situated in the material world there are so many material impurities there also therefore when the drops of water from the tips of the lord's shoulder hairs when sprinkled upon the bodies of the inhabitants of the higher planets they felt purified the ganges water is pure because of its emanating from the toe of the lord and there is no difference between the water emanating from the lord and that from the tips of the hair on the shoulder of lord bore they are both absolute and transcendental om agyanati mirandhasya gyananjani shalakaya chakshurun militam yena तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः नमः ओम विष्णु पादाय कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे वाञ्चाकल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य च पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम अम राम हरे 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 कृष्णा I'm grateful to be here, the Lotus Feet of the Lord Shri Pumi Dwarakadish. And today, I'll talk on the topic of the nature of the divine descent. I'll use this as a whiteboard or a blackboard to be more precise to draw some things and write some things. So, the idea of the divine descent is a great mystery across various world traditions. and i'll talk about this in four broad points i'll talk about the mainstream christian idea of the descent i'll talk about the islamic idea of the descent then i'll talk about the impersonalist idea of the descent and then i'll talk about the vaishnava understanding so in the significant point being made over here is that the prayers are being offered by the residents of janaloka now if we consider in the universe as we know there are the higher planetary systems there are the middle planetary systems and then the lower planetary systems so those in the higher generally those in swarga loka are they are considered to have many material desires but those above that satya tapa jan loka they are considered those here are considered extremely pure mm-hmm. and yet it is being said that those residents of that pure world they feel purified when the water coming from the body of a hog has fallen on them now a hog is if we consider even the earthly planetary system even here a hog is considered impure and some people might say this is just a cultural thing but it is not simply a, some cultures considered impure the idea is that a hog eats foul substances and because of that it is considered impure so but it said that that which is considered impure in this world is actually considered pure in a higher world that even the residents of tapaloka so they are saying that so while here a hog is considered impure but there they are placing a hog as pure prabhupad uses the word lord hog lord boar they are considering as far far above us and we will become purified by this so how does this happen how do they get purified so here the idea is 
in general across the world's traditions it's understood that there is a higher level of reality the spiritual level where there's paradise heaven whatever the terminology used and the material level and the idea of avatar is that the lord descends from the higher level to this level of reality from the spiritual level to the material level the word avatar literally means avatariti one who descends to this world that being is avatar nowadays the word avatar has become common in social media people say this is my insta avatar or this is my video facebook avatar the idea is that they have their representation uh, which is existing in that world so the, the word avatar has become more generic and the idea of crossing from one domain to another domain from our physical world to the digital world that is also called as avatar so to cross over to manifest from one level to another level that is the idea of avatar now with respect to this is the idea we could say the divine comes to the human level now how does this happen so the there is as i said i'll discuss various ideas the christian idea is that when the divine descends the divine becomes human the christians say that the divinity of christ is manifested in the humanity of jesus and if this is an essential statement that i see in creed after jesus departed for almost four centuries uh, after his crucifixion christians were conflicted and conflicting they were internally conflicted and they were fighting with each other about who exactly was jesus and then finally was he god was he son of god so they have their own version of something like achintya bheda bhed and they say that jesus was fully human and the divinity of christ who is fully divine was manifested in jesus so they say that jesus experienced the pains that we experienced he went through life as we lived it he when he was crucified blood came from his body and he felt the pain so their idea is god becomes human god becomes human and that is why in their tradition the word incarnation came for the first time now incarnation literally means karna is flesh so to come in flesh incarnation so the idea is the divine came in flesh now islam while it came from the same tradition the same abrahamic tradition islam has the idea that the divine can never become human the dis- the descent of the divine to the human that is never possible it's it's something which the world is so profane that the divine can never descend to this world and that's why they have the idea that never descend to this world because the world is so profane the world is so impure so sinful that the divine can never descend to this world now when i'm talking about christianity and islam each of these have many different variations and sometimes their beliefs vary but i am talking about the mainstream ideas that the divine never descends to this world and that's why they say jesus is a prophet just like many other past prophets and they claim that the highest prophet is muhammad and that because they consider muhammad to be the highest they very strongly oppose the depiction of muhammad because they think if he is depicted he is drawn in art then we will start thinking people start thinking that he is mundane some strands of islam even forbid art itself and many of them forbid art in the in the quran in the in the mosque because they say that this will give us a human conception of the divine we are imposing a human form now in between we could say is the bhakti understanding that the divine becomes human comes in human form but remains divine and although god comes in human form he does not become human he remains divine so when krishna comes in a human form he is still krishna he is still god and still he has come in a human form 
and the distinctiveness of the vedic understanding is that in these traditions the hu only humans are considered to be sentient or specifically in terms of rational beings that they can perceive god the vedic tradition says the bhakti tradition says god can what to speak of coming in human form he can come in any form he can come even in the form like fish and hear boar and that is the inclusiveness of the bhakti conception and the key point is through prayers like this it is being demonstrated that he comes to this world but he is not affected by this world he remains transcendental prabhupad gives the example that a king or might go into the prison cell but that does not mean the king has become a prisoner the king might go into the darkest of prison cells the king might go into the underground dungeons where only the worst of criminals are put and still the king does not become a prisoner like that <coughs> there is we could say a hierarchy of human beings we know a living being there are 8.4 million human be living beings and there is a hierarchy now humans are considered highest and then we have the aquatics who are considered the lowest so and above these is the divine realm is this where krishna resides so now the idea is the divine can come in a human fo form the divine can come in any form the divine can come even in the lowest of forms and yet the divine remains divine he is not affected and that's why these great sages in satya loka jan loka tap loka they are saying that we are purified by the touch of the water coming from you so why is it so significant to understand the purity of the lord that so within now the problem with these two ideas is two ideas that the divine becomes fully human hmm? they say that this breeds empathy that god has experienced all the pains we have experienced and thus god knows our suffering well god doesn't have to go through the pains we are experiencing to know the pains we are experiencing when prabhupad was asked this question that that swami uh, swami prabhupad spoke strongly against drugs and one person asked prabhupad that swami ji have you taken drugs and prabhupad says i don't have to take drugs i haven't but my my students have taken drugs and they know their experiences so it is not that to know what somebody is experiencing we have to actually experience that the world is a complex place and not everything needs to be experienced to be understood yes experience gives em 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 empathy but experience can also lead to ignorance yes the experience can give empathy when i understand somebody has gone through something i can become more empathetic but experience can also perpetuate ignorance sometimes when we experience something we get so caught in that experience if like somebody says I'll, i'll drink alcohol just to experience it i'll take drugs to experience it and sometimes that ex experience can broaden our vision sometimes experience can narrow our vision also how can experience narrow our vision if we get too caught in that experience and then we can't come out of it so the lord becomes human but he does not descend to the human domain he does not lord descends to the human domain but he does not become human and to say that the world is so profane that that the divine can never descend that raises the question where exactly did the world come from if god is the world is so sinful that god can't even touch it are we actually protecting god's are we actually emphasizing god's omniscience or are we saying that the world's contaminating potency is stronger than god's purifying potency that if god comes to this world he will become contaminated so so what happens is this this idea it actually minimizes the power of god the idea that god can never become um, come as the world in the world it minimizes god's power so this is the problems with the christian and the uh, islamic conceptions of descent now i'll talk about the advaitic conception the impersonalist conception 
Now, often the impersonal idea, it is of impersonalism is often presented as, that I am God, you are God. Mm. I saw a t-shirt which one student was wearing in one university where I had gone. He says, I was, a, I was an atheist till I discovered that I was God. <laughs> now, when in India I started, I was, I was born and brought up in India, when I started exploring spirituality, so the common widespread conception is that we are God. So when I first read that, my, my first thought was, if I am God, then the world is in big trouble. <laughs> I can't manage my own life if I have to manage the whole world. The world is in big trouble. <laughs> now, this idea that we are God is actually, if you go to hardcore impersonalists, they say it's a distortion of the idea. Because the common understanding is, say this is, the common idea of understanding of impersonalism is, say we are this, so this is the soul, this is Atma, and this is God. And then the two will merge. And then there'll be only God remain. Only what so in that sense we will become God. We'll go inside, we'll become God. That is the common understanding of impersonalism. But if we go, if we talk with hardcore impersonalists, they dismiss this as Neo Mayavad. They say this is this is not what we actually teach. This is a misrepresentation. What is their teaching? Their teaching is Brahman is the only reality. Brahma Satya, everything else is Mithya. And then their claim or their belief is when Brahman takes on Sattva, when Brahman is contaminated by Sattva, then we have Ishwar. So, Ishwar is also an God or Ishwar is also an illusion which comes when Brahman is contaminated by Sattva. When Brahman is contaminated by Rajas, by the mode of passion, then what comes is the Jiva, the soul, the Atma. And when Brahman is contaminated by Tamas, what comes is Prakriti, is material nature. So from their conception, Enlightenment doesn't mean the Jiva and the Ishwar, they become one. Their idea is not that this will go here and that will be enlightenment. Their idea is enlightenment means you understand Prakriti is Maya, you understand Jiva is Maya, you understand Ishwar is Maya. And all that exists is the non-differentiated Brahman. So they don't think we become God. That's why they, many of the Ishwara Prabhupada uses the word atheist sometimes for impersonalists. And many, many people who are not really impersonalists but under impersonal influence. If we consider impersonalism, it's a huge body of, large number of people are impersonalists. But actually, most of them, a very, very small portion of them are philosophical impersonalists. That means they actually know the philosophy of impersonalism. And they actually believe that when we are worshipping the deity, the idea is, the deity is also an illusion, I am also an illusion, and ultimately, we are all going to Brahman. That idea is among very few impersonalists. Most people are cultural impersonalists. What do I mean cultural impersonalists? That not that there is a culture of impersonalism, but that they just were born, brought up in a culture where impersonalism was common. So impersonalists also do kirtan, impersonalists also do, do do puja, and they think, okay, this is nice. They will they will go there. So you could say more personally, more personally, they are under impersonalist influence, and that means they may have read some some impersonalist teachers teachings and they might be, and they, all that they know is oh this person is a spiritual person this person is a considered a wise person and they respect that person they really don't know much about their teachings it's very superficial so such people who are under impersonalist influence if you call them atheists 
they get enraged. How can you call me an atheist? I worship God. Now, when, why does Prabhupada use the word atheist sometimes for impersonalists? Because of this idea. They say God is also an illusion. Now, this philosophical impersonalists, they say we are not atheists, we are transtheists. That means we are transcendental to theism. That belief in God is a preliminary idea and we go beyond that idea. So this is quite insidious. And that's why Prabhupada was so strong against this. So, that the form of the Lord is the ultimate reality. Not that there is a reality beyond the form of the Lord. So, the Bhagavatam again and again through prayers like this emphasizes that it is not that Brahman is the ultimate reality. Rather, we can put it that there is one ultimate reality. Ah, let's put it this way. There is one ultimate reality and that reality is realized at multiple levels. So, vadanti tat tattvavita tattvam yad jnana madvayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan iti shabdhyate So, Bhagavan, Paramatma and Brahman. I'll conclude with this point. So, they are all one reality. The Shrimad Bhagavatam in 1 to 11, it says that everything is Advaya Jnana. That all of it is realized truth. Advaya Jnana. It's one, once we go beyond the dualities of the material world, in the knowledge that we get, we understand that this absolute truth, this ultimate reality is one. So in one sense, Bhagawan, Paramatma and Brahman are one and the same thing. They are non-different. And yet another level they are different. Why? Because that same ultimate reality, it is realized to different degrees. Hey, suppose we consider something like a, say a gulab jamun. Now a gulab jamun, suppose we experience its fragrance. We are sitting here and suddenly the fragrance comes in. Hey, that seems attractive. So when we experience the fragrance of the gulab jamun, there is some experience. There is some appreciation of the gulab jamun. So, after the fragrance, then suppose we go and then we experience the sight of the gulab jamun. Oh, what if it's coming from? Oh, these balls look so nice and juicy. That is a further experience. And then after that, if we experience the taste of the gulab jamun, we eat it. Ah, that is the ultimate experience. So now, when we are experiencing the fragrance of the gulab jamun, it is the same gulab jamun. The gulab jamun is the same, but the experience is partial. When we are seeing the, when we are experiencing that fragrance and the taste, sorry, fragrance and the form, the sight, actually better to use the word form because it's that's the attribute. When we are experiencing the form, again it is the same gulab jamun. But our experience is a little more complete. But when we experience the fragrance, form and taste, that is when it is the complete experience of the gulab jamun. Now suppose this gulab jamun hmm, uh, had three different names. Somebody throughout their life has only experienced the fragrance. And they came up with a name, something called fragrant. They know that gulab jamun as fragrant. Then somebody who has experienced the form, they come up with a name for it, beautiful. And then somebody who has experienced the taste, they come up with the name, delicious. So now three people may be calling the gulab jamun by different names. Fragrant, beautiful, delicious. But all three are experiencing the same thing. Similarly, the absolute truth we could say over here to a table like this the same metaphor we can apply that 
the attributes. So if you can see the absolute truth's attributes. So the, the absolute truth has three attributes. It is Sat, Chit and Ananda. So when only the Sat aspect of the absolute truth is experienced. Hmm? Oh, there is something eternal beyond this material world. When only the Sat aspect of the absolute truth is experienced, that is called as Brahman. Hmm? That means, um, Yuga Swami in his Sandarvas explains this point, that when we understand that this whole world is changing, fleeting, but there is something enduring beyond it. That is when we realize the Brahman aspect. But when along with the Sat, we also experience the Chit. That means we understand that that is not just an eternal existence. There is an eternal existence which is conscious. That that divine oversees the world. And that overseeing aspect of the divine is also eternal. That is called as the Paramatma aspect. So it is like the same Gulab Jamun. When we taste, when we, when we smell it and then we see it. The same absolute truth, when we perceive its eternity, when we perceive its cognitiveness, its cognition, its cogn conscious potency, that is Paramatma. And when there is Sat, Chit and Ananda, that means this is not just like a judge who is witnessing the world and who is observing the world, evaluating. It's a living, loving person who experiences joy, who looks joy for joy, who reciprocates love and experiences joy therein, then that is the realization of the Bhagavan aspect. So at one level, Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan are the same, just as the three experiences of the Gulab Jamun are experiences of the same object. But on another level, Bhagavan is the most complete experience. Bhagavan is the highest reality. And it is that reality that the Bhagavatam consistently demonstrates. It is that reality which is manifested as the deity. It is that reality which the Prabhupada shared all over the world. And that reality of Bhagavan is so attractive. If Bhagavan is presented in, his, in fullness, Prabhupada was asked, how did you attract so many people all over the world? And Prabhupada said, Krishna is all attractive. I just presented him as it is. And he attracted everyone. So this is what our heart aspires for. And by this radical example of the divine being in a form that is considered impure and still purifying even the pure, that, that highest nature of the divine descent, the highest nature of the form of the Lord is being emphasized in this prayer. So I'll summarize. I discussed three main points. I started by talking about the conceptions, the Abrahamic conceptions of the descent. How the Christian conception is that the Lord descends and becomes human. That the two opposite conceptions are then Islam and Christianity. Now the problem is God doesn't need to experience this world to know what is going on in this world. And to say that God can never descend to this world, that is also to say that where does such an impure world come from and how can the world's contaminating potency be greater than God's contaminating potency, God's purifying potency. Then it discuss the impersonalist idea. They say that when the Lord descends, he is actually in Maya. He is the Brahman taking on the mode of Sattva. And their idea is that it is not that we worship God and we become one with God. It is rather when we worship God, we realize both we and God are illusion. And that's why they call themselves trans theists. And Prabhupada appropriately refers to them as theists because they claim that God is an illusion. So I discuss the impersonal conception. And then we discuss the bhakti conception that is of descent, that it is God in his fullness descends to this world. So I give the example of the Gulab Jamun to illustrate how the personal divinity is the fullest realization of the div divine. Just like experiencing the fragrance, sight and taste of the Gulab Jamun is the fullest experience. Similarly, experiencing the divine as Sat Chit Anand, as an eternal, cognizant and pleasure, pleasurable person is the fullest experience of the divine. And that is what Srila Prabhupada offers us through his 
Krishna conscious this moment. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Shall we stop? We have some time for questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> I'd just like to start off by saying that that was amazing. I mean, I thank you so much for that class. I just, I don't have the words to describe how good I thought it was. It's really incredible. Um, they have an expression, you know, they say you learn something new every day. Well, I think I learned something new today. I really didn't understand the impersonalist conception properly. I was for 50, last 50 years thinking that, you know, it's the, you merge with the, with God, and that was yeah, the impersonalist Yeah, that is what some are impersonalists, in the modern day impersonalists say, but that is not Shankara's teaching, that is not the traditional impersonalist teaching. Right, well, I didn't understand that, which certainly didn't understand it clearly. I, I don't think I understood it at all, so you just so nicely explained it. So my question is this, I have a question, it's, it's related, and uh, it's, I was just reading the Bhagavad Gita this morning, chapter 9, text 3, and, and I came across this sentence, Prabhupada says, unfortunate people, even after hearing about the evidence, even after hearing all the evidence of the Vedic literature from great personalities, still have no faith in God. Okay? So here's my question. You're familiar with the man Stephen Myers of Discovery Institute? He wrote yeah. that book, Return of the God of Okay, so he's an educated man and he's, you know, scientific background like yourself, okay? Now, if he read a statement like that and say in a nice way, not an obnoxious way, he came and said, you know, I kind of feel um, that you've, you've, it's a little bit unfair what you're saying. I mean, I believe in God. I, I, I consider myself somebody who believes in God. How, why is it that just because I don't believe in your version that you're saying that I don't believe in God? I mean, you're saying that this, you know, all the unfortunate people after hearing all the evidence of the Vedic literature, well, it seems like to me that what you're saying, what you're referring to as evidence is just statements. How, is, how are statements from the Vedic literature to be considered evidence? How do they furnish proof of the things that they're attesting to? You know, how would you respond to him? Okay. It's a big question. I'll try to answer as quickly as possible. So the question is that if somebody who is a theist in another tradition reads this question, it may say that you're unfortunate if you don't accept the evidence of Krishna's supremacy as given the Vedas. Well, uh, how would they process that? Well, Srila Prabhupada was quite clear about, you know, who he was writing his books for. If you see Prabhupada's broad attitude, Shila Prabhupada, I had done a bit of a study of Srila Prabhupada's attitude towards Christians. You know, if they were, if they were nominal Christians, they just born in a Christian family, then he would encourage them to straight, just take up Krishna Bhakti. Hmm? That this is the Krishna Bhakti, we have the mercy of Mahaprabhu, Krishna is the highest man, highest revelation of the divine, take up Krishna Bhakti. But if they were, you could say, dedicated Christians, then he would just encourage them to practice Christian, become bitter Christians. He would quote from their Christian about, uh, thou shall not kill. And he would encourage them to become more, more sattvic, you could say, rise in their path. So, one time when some Christians had come to meet Prabhupada and one of his disciples started quoting from the Bible to talk with them. And Prabhupada would quote the Bible sometimes. Prabhupada said, you know, you know, they will never accept our authority when we quote their scriptures. They will have their own interpretation of things. I'm paraphrasing, of course, here what Prabhupada said. So the point is that Prabhupada recognized that we cannot expect others those who do not accept the Vedas as evidence, for them there is a different way to present. Sorry. For them there is a different way to present. For them there is reasoning. You know, reasoning is what is required. When Prabhupada talks about evidences, it is for somebody who has accepted that, that epistemological system. In general, you know, if two people are fighting, you know, say if one person at this level, other person at this level and the two of them are fighting with swords you know this person is moving his sword all the way here this person is moving the word sword here they're not even touching each other because there are different levels isn't it for two people to fight both of them have to be at the same level especially if they're fighting not with bows and arrows but with swords the swords just don't reach the other person 
So like that, when two people have to have a discussion, then both of them have to have some common foundation. Otherwise, there's no possibility of discussion. So within the Vedic tradition, Shastra was this foundation. Hmm? And that's why Shastri quotations were given. In the Christian tradition, maybe that there, the Bible would be their foundation. Now, in, within the Vedic tradition also, there is, so this is, so these are, say, for example, personalists and impersonalists. When they are going to argue, both of them will quote the Vedas. And Prabhupada in that section is specifically referring to those who accept the authority of the Vedas, but they don't accept these evidence. They try to come to some other conclusion. Then they are saying that Prabhupada is calling them unfortunate. But in our own tradition, we have had, say, in the broad Indian tradition, there have been uh, schools of thought like Buddhism and Jainism, which didn't accept the Vedic authority. And for them, what was the, what was the basis for reasoning? That was Nyaya, that was logic. Hmm? It was not Shastra. It was, okay, you use reasoning to prove how their reasoning is inadequate. Their philosophy is inadequate. Mahaprabhu quotes Shastra with Prakashanan Saraswati and with Sarobhattacharya. But when he meets the Buddhists, he doesn't quote Shastra. So, my understanding would be, first is a statement, yeah, Prabhupada is talking about a particular epistemological system within which the certain statements are accepted as evidence. And now we can go into Jiva Goswami Sandarbhas, especially the first Sandarbha, Tato Sandarbha, where he talks about how we all have four defects and therefore we need a divine source of knowledge. So how the Vedas are evidence, that's a whole different subject. We all, we all know about that separately. But the point is, with such people, we have to show that the, every statement is meant for a particular context. So this statement is for that context where the Vedic authority is accepted. Can I, can I see if I've understood what you said? So the Prabhupada's target audience for that statement is not the whole world. He's speaking to people who've accepted the authority of the Vedas, yes. the Vedic Shastras, but who are unfortunately are not able to accept the evidence of Krishna, Correct. the yes. Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yep. Yes, perfect. Okay. In the Got same it. Gita, I don't remember the exact words, Prabhupada in one place says, hey, we can worship any form of Krishna, Ram, Narasimha, Narayan. And in the 18th chapter, I think, Prabhupada, 1865, in one of the purports, he says that one should not deviate one's mind to even the form of Narayan or Ram. Should worship only Krishna and Rindav. So that Prabhupada is speaking more as a Gaudiya Vaishnava in the mood of Rindavan. So we can look at the statements and we can, from that we can infer you know, what audience Prabhupada is speaking to. Okay. So, let's go, please. Thank you for an amazing class. Beautiful. Um, just on this thread, uh, sometimes we can be accused of being narrow-minded. So how do you deal with this issue of being that, that accusation against our philosophy and what we what we teach that we're narrow minded. Although I don't think we are narrow minded, but this comes up. Can you give an example of what point makes us because narrow minded is a very broad term. Which well, point you know that we won't we won't allow any kind of other understanding to come in con you know, and any anything is a is a conflict with us. It's conflicting. So how do you preach? Okay. To those individuals that have this kind of mentality. Yeah. So now, thank you, Bro. So we say that some people accuse us of being narrow minded because we don't agree with anything that disagrees with us. Yeah. Something like that. Well, there is that saying that we need to be open minded but not empty minded. <laughs> that means that we can be open minded but not so open minded that our brains fall out. So, so see that ultimately the mind is like the mouth. The mouth has to be open to take food in. But for the food to benefit, the mouth also has to close. <laughs> so similarly, the mind has to open, be open to ideas. But the mind has to close around some ideas to grasp those ideas. So that's why if somebody is only open-minded, hmm, then basically, then they cannot have any, any convictions at all. They're only open-minded. Hmm? They cannot have any convictions at all because they're not holding on to anything. So our understanding is that, see there is 
with respect to re religious systems there are three approaches there is exclusivism which is the which is what the abrahamic reli abrahamic religions often are that we have ours is the only way to god hmm? it's almost like we have exclusive rights to god and that comes off as very narrow minded mm -hmm. now the opposite so this is the often it is thought of this is the abrahamic religions hmm? and then the opposite of it is pluralism oh there are many ways to god and extreme of this comes within some forms of hinduism which say there are as many ways to god as there are human beings and they say all paths lead to the same goal all paths lead to god when prince prabhupad was asked this question that if all paths lead what prabhupad krishna says in the gita that whatever you do you will come to me prabhupad said if that was a reality then why does krishna have to even speak the gita is it whatever arjuna does that will be fine it's not that simple so our understanding is more of what can be called as inclusivism inclusivism means that we understand that there is a hierarchy there are multiple levels of reality and within the broad vedic conception various levels of various ideas of the divine with its conceptions of the ultimate reality they are included so for example we don't say we say krishna is god but our understanding of divinity is very inclusive in the sense that if somebody worships nature we have something analogous as a universal form if somebody considers uh, the the ultimate truth to be all pervading in person we have the brahman conception and we don't reject the brahman conception so we have the universal form somebody worships particular forms in this world you know there are the worship of the devatas so there are multiple manifestations of divine that are, the divine that are accepted and the point is we do consider krishna to be the highest but that does not mean that we reject all other forms of all other understandings of the divine that is in the 17th chapter arjuna is asked by krishna that arjuna asked krishna rather that if somebody does not have faith in the scriptural understanding then what is their nature and krishna says look at their modes and you can look at their modes through how, what food they eat through what kind of sacrifices they do what kind of austerities they do and by that we can understand what their level of consciousness is what their what their um, what their position on the path towards the divine is so yes is it intolerance is a narrow mindedness if a doctor says that you know this is a medicine that will cure you and this is something which will not cure you that is not narrow minded so if somebody says this is the 100th floor and this is the 10th floor this is the ground floor now to say that this is the 100th floor is not narrow minded it is if it is actually the 100th floor so now how we will explain that that will vary from person to person so krishna says in the gita that even if somebody is at a lower level don't disturb their minds elevate them na buddhi bhedam janaye ta gyanam karma sangina so my understanding is not the philosophy itself is is narrow minded sometimes the way we present the philosophy is narrow minded that means we don't give space for people like prabhupad said that it is better to have one moon than a thousand stars which is true but if we consider which la prabhupad went in india to the houses of life members and life members didn't become devotees but they contributed and practically very few life members became devotees so still prabhupad encouraged them so prabhupad had the one moon and prabhupad also accepted the thousand stars if there is to be a choice prabhupad said we prefer one moon to thousand stars now when he went to the just yes, yesterday i had gone to meet giriraj maharaj so we were talking he said that you know it was not that prabhupad was constantly pushing the life members chant 16 round chant 16 rounds come for the morning program no they were at their place and prabhupad accepted them their place and he encouraged them to read his books come to the temple but he was not pushing them constantly so they were like a thousand stars prabhupad accepted them also he gave them a place so we need to be like that so unfortunately nowadays in trying to focus on that one moon we not only reject the thousand stars we sometimes extinguish the thousand stars <laughs> we end up if somebody doesn't accept our, the highest understanding 
we condemn them and reject them so much that they become against our movement so prabhupada had that spirit where he could both be the way i put it is prabhupada was conclusive and inclusive hmm. so prabhupada gave a conclusion and at the same time he gave a space for those who were not ready to be at the conclusion prabhupada strongly criticized mayavadis but at the same time he said if you see a mayavadi sanyasi respect him when this uh, from the yoga mishra from the mishra yoga studio in new york this dr mishra with him prabhupada had stayed he came to meet prabhupada after many years prabhupada had a very cordial talk with him they took lunch together and giriraj ma asked prabhupada that prabhupada i thought he is a mayavadi prabhupada said Philosophically, we argue like anything, but culturally, we are friends. So, Prabhupad could respect a person for their uh, something which were good in them. So, we can be just because we have to be inclusive does not mean we have to be inclusive, and just because we are inclusive does not mean we have to be exclusive. So, that balance Prabhupad is embodied, and then if we can follow his footsteps, I think we can also do that. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, well, Prabhu. Thank you for a very nice presentation. There's one phrase that you use that can be misunderstood. You, you said several times that the absolute can assume any form, but it's not that there are forms existing and then the absolute decides to assume that form. All forms come from the absolute. Okay. Ahang sarvasya prabha. So the fish form exists eternally. It's not a form that Krishna assumes it periodically. If you look at Krishna's lotus feet, there's a fish there. So the fish form is eternal. Krishna's lotus feet are eternal. The marks in his feet are eternal. So anything that exists on Krishna's lotus foot is eternal. The ankusha, okay. the the flower, everything that's on Krishna's is an eternal form. So the fish form is eternal. The hog form is eternal. These are all eternal forms, not forms that he assumes, because all forms come out of the absolute. They exist because they're there in the absolute. So it's not that Krishna decides one day, you know, let me become a bird t tomorrow. The bird form already <laughs> exists, and all these forms exist because they are there in Krishna. So I just wanted to, okay, to, yeah, okay. to have you I consider that, you. because some people can misunderstand that. Thank that, you. you know, oh, here's a form, and if Krishna wants, he can assume that form. No, that form exists because it comes from Krishna. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, agree. I appreciate that point. It's just that I was talking from the reference point of this material world. See, in the spiritual world itself, there are Advaita, Machyutam, Anadi, Vananta, Rupam. But from this world's point of view, There are many, many forms, and we can say those forms are replicas of forms that are existing in the higher world, and the Lord comes in those forms. So, yes, that is true. So we can say the Lord, more precisely, the Lord manifests can manifest in any form rather than assume any form. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, in your presentation about God as coming as a person and He remains divine. Um, we have many examples how when Lord Ramachandra came, when Krishna came, Lord Chaitanya came, displayed uh, forms that sometimes it can be bewildering. Like in the case of in the Krishna book when uh, Krishna was fighting with Salva. And at one moment, it is mentioned that for one moment he actually becomes really bewildered. So does he actually, my question is, does he actually sometimes, he chooses to all the time be, I mean, he remains divine all the time, but at po a point, at a certain point he's not, because Yag Yoga Maya reminds him. Otherwise, somebody else can say, you just put your words of transcendental and you feed your philosophy according to what you okay, want to question, be. Okay, good question, yeah. So does Krishna sometimes get overwhelmed and bewildered, like it happened when Shalva apparently lopped off the head of Vasudev, and Krishna appeared bewildered? Lord Ramachandra in separation from Sita. Well, the two things over here, there is Tattva and there is Leela. Now, in terms of the Tattva, the Lord is always unbewildered. He is beyond Maya. Hmm? And in terms of Leela, he adapts emotions appropriate for the past time. So whatever be that appropriate emotion. Tattva and Leela. Leela. Unbewildered. Sorry, the handwriting is not clear. Okay, appropriate. So uh, he assumes all appropriate emotions. 
Now, for example, uh, when Mother Yashoda is chasing him for having stolen butter, he's fearful. Now, is that fear just to show? He's actually experiencing fear. And that's what makes that Leela so relishable. So, in the process, when the Lord performs Leela, in one sense, he subordinates his divinity for the purpose of reciprocating love. So, he, he, the very fact that he's a child who needs his mother to feed him, how is he God? Well, he's God who is chosen to play that role. And when he's playing that role, he is still God, but he fully immerses himself in that role. And because he immerses himself in that role, he actually experiences those emotions. He experiences fear. My mother is angry with me. What will she do? How will she punish me? I don't want to be punished. So that is actually uh, the that is the express the, the demonstration of how much Krishna wants to reciprocate love with his devotees. So there are three levels you could say. And I was once giving a class where I said that the Vrajavasis don't accept that Krishna is God. <laughs> And one person in the audience says, I also don't accept Krishna as God. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we consider this is the spiritual level, this is below that the material level. If somebody is not accepting Krishna as God, that is ignorance. Mm -hmm. But the Vrajivasi is not accepting Krishna God, that is transcendence. It's completely different. So, this one a last example to explain this. That consider a play. Now, in that play, there is a script writer who gives the whole script about how a drama is to be enacted. Then there is a director. And then there is the actor. So the actor, in a good play, acts according to the director's direction. But the director directs according to the script writer's script. So, in Krishna Leela, if you can see, the one of the meanings of the word Leela itself is play. Hmm? Prabhupada translated as pastime, but it also translated as play many times. And Prabhupada also used as a play at times. So, in Krishna Leela, Krishna is the actor. Hmm? Krishna is the actor. Yoga Maya is the director. So, when Krishna is in that play, he is completely immersed. So when he's fighting and when he sees Vasudev, oh, my father is killed. What's this? He's experienced that emotion of shock, that horror. He's experiencing that. And that's real experience. However, the twist is that, so the twist here is that Krishna is the, Krishna is the actor hmm, and Yagama is the director, but Krishna is also the script writer. So, Yoga Maya is directing according to Krishna's script. And therefore, what happens is, Krishna is simultaneously not in control as the actor and is in control as the script writer. So, this is Achintya Bheda within the domain of Leela. Okay. This can never, can never be a... You can never explain this to someone who's not a believer, right? Or someone who doesn't have faith. Yeah. It's just for the believers, for one who... Yeah, that's why I think before they can move forward, they need to understand the concept of Leela. Yeah. That this God does not delight in his divinity. God delights in the reciprocation of law. Prabhupada would give the example of, I think, the British Prime Minister Gladstone or someone. He said that a very powerful person, but he was playing as a horsey for his grandson. Why? Because he wants to reciprocate love. So, if we can focus on the principle of Leela as the reciprocation of love, then these points can be gradually understood. So Krishna is not an insecure God who constantly has to demonstrate his divinity. He is completely secure and he just wants to savor love with each other. Okay? Thank you. Very good. Yes, Let's, okay, last question. So we have two, <clears throat> we have Ab Abrahamic understanding, you know, Muslim uh, Christians, and we have impersonalists, and we have also Bhaktas. So, is it, uh, which one is easier to change, to turn to the Bhakti? Abrahamic, you know, people 
follower of Brahmic religion or uh, impersonalist. Okay. Who are easier to change? Well, it depends. See, in general, if you consider, if you consider this is Krishna, hmm, if somebody is coming from the Abrahamic path and somebody is coming from the impersonal past, from the Abrahamic path, they primarily have hmm, cultural barriers. That means that oh, in, in that tradition, worshipping a form is considered anathema. So the idea of worshipping God, which is a very central part of the culture. The idea of loving God is common in the Abrahamic religions. And that is what Srila Prabhupada focused on his teachings. So for them, often the cultural, cultural aspects, the idea, because in the Old Testament, as well as in the Quran, there are so many instances whenever a king conquers the kingdom and the first thing he goes is he goes and destroys all the idols that are there because their idea is that those idols are all false gods so somebody coming from the abrahamic faith for them it is a cultural barrier that is more for somebody who is coming from the impersonal path culturally they are very similar they, they respect the vedas they respect cows they go to temples for them it's more of a conceptual barrier the barrier is that the concept, oh, you know, that we have to merge in God, that we are one with God. No, God is eternally supreme and we are eternally subordinate. And that is actually a state of joy, not a state of uh, bondage or slavery. That conceptual barrier has to be overcome. So it depends. Is this one easier? Well, it, it depends on the individual, it depends on context. I think everybody has their challenges. Srila Prabhupada, during his times, was phenomenally successful in the West hmm. in getting people to go beyond the cultural barriers. He presented Krishna Bhakti. Now, in today's world, it seems that in India, we are Bhakti is growing very rap Bhakti is growing rapidly. So, it seems that in the West, there are obstacles. So, I think this goes through time. It changes according to times. So, we have to, we have to play the card that we have been handed. <coughs> So we do the best in whatever way we can. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada.